Hello, and this is Herosia Soft Bubble. This is Herosia Scheib, and I'm here with another episode of Herosia Soft Bubble. This is episode four. I don't spend a nickel if I can help it, unless it somehow profits my mileage account. Uh, in this episode, we're doing a, a review of the Bitcoin company called Purse.io. If you're unaware of Purse.io, it is a company that allows you to make purchases through it, Amazon, with Bitcoin. So we're going to talk about the company, my personal experiences with it, the history and review, just a, your typical review show. But before we get into discussing Purse.io, the new. This article comes from PC Gamer. It's time for Shubber- cyberpunk games to remember how to be punk by Jody uh, McGregor. Cyberpunk games nail the grim and neon, but too often forget the underdogs and losers who define the genre. At the start of the 1988 adventure game, based on the William Gibson genre defining cyberpunk novel, A uh, Neuromancer, you, you wake up face down in a plate of spaghetti. Well, it's a synthetic spaghetti because this is the future, but that doesn't make it any more comfortable. Like the book's protagonist, Case, you're a down-and-out former council cowboy who lost the ability to hack, but in your case, it's not due to a traumatic surgery, but simple poverty. You can't afford a new computer. Hell, you can't even afford to pay for the spaghetti. Arthur Bruce Sterling sum up the cyberpunk genre as a combination of low life and high tech. And that's a perfect description of both versions of Necromancer. Later in the game, you have the option to sell your internal organs for cash and hack it. a computer as cheap hotel. It's an actual name to pay the rent. Your life is about as low as they get. In 1993, Syndicate went into the opposite direction, casting you as the CEO and the charge of a corporation bent on global domination. In Syndicate, you're the villain at the top of the dystopian food chain. While most of the game games in the genre that follow explore spaces be- somewhere in between those two extremes, there's been a tendency for them to focus on high tech and not the low life. They get the cyber, but not the punk. Hero Complex. Take the heroes of Dex X series. J.C. Dent is an augmented agent who works for the UN anti-terrorist organization. Alex D. is an augmented agent in training at the Taurus Academy with a bright future in the WTO. And Adam Jensen is the augmented chief of security for Biotech Corporation. All these characters go through a learning experience to show their employers are untrustworthy and the world is more complex than they thought it was. But they all start on the privileged side of the fence. When low life characters do show up, they push to the periphery. And Adam Jensen walks past some punks, gather around a bin fire in the streets of Detroit so he can overhear a conversation about getting a dog cybernetically enhanced to take part in a pit fight. In the lower Seattle DX uh, Invisible War, Alex D also meets two people totaled around a burning bin, one of whom is a low town Lucy, a Pierce punk who provides some basic info on the area while reprimanding you for being an upper Seattle tourist. She points out how out of the element you are in the poor part of town, but is doing so makes it clear you're out of place in the genre as well. That's not to say that those are no cyber board badasses who learn their law isn't always right in cyberpunk outside of the games. Robocop and Ghost in the Shell are both classic examples of this story, but the video game characters like Murphy and Kanengsi are rarity. They're, they're the norm. The Heroes of the Crusade, No Remorse, Hard Reset, Final Fantasy VII, Binary Domain, all their tough guys who learn the, learn the rebels and terrorists have a point. There's homage from uh, Necromancer rather than the story's actual main character, Casey and Molly, the Misfits. Influ- influential as Necromancer is not the only flight for cyberpunk, uh, Blade Runner gave us the archetype of the futuristic investigator forced to see a bigger, more troubling world beyond the next case. Citizen, whether detectives like in Psychopaths or crusading journalists like in Max Headroom, plenty of cyberpunk stories have been about characters who attempt to solve crime but stumble in more filth. In Max Headroom, plenty of cyberpunk stories have been about characters who attempt to solve crime but stumble in more philosophical questions. Games like Tex Murphy series, Techno. Babylon, Anarnix, Westwood's Blade Runner, and more recently Ready Only Memories all fit into that category. But even here, with the shady heroes who live in cramped apartments, the order of the day, the lowlifes often get a raw deal. In Read Only Memories, you see two punks named Starfucker, (laughs) that's a good name, and Oli, and immediately accuse them of an unrelated act of vandalism and chase them down after which you're given the option to call the police like some kind of tool of a man. If you don't get to know them better and learn that they're not bad guys, but then the grand decision to comedy sidekicks, these two wacky guys instead. They feel like token inclusions cast aside by the climax when they deserve to be central. 
In the end, it turns out that Starfucker and Ollie are guilty of vandalism you accuse them of, but still it's rough to see the characters with Mohawks and Shades treated so roughly in a game that's all about evoking the classic retro cyberpunk feel. Like so many games, Read Only Memories borrows visuals from Akira, but in Akira, the, ba- the biker gangs are the heroes. Recycling is an essential part of cyberpunk fiction. It's cities full of repurposed junk given new life. The initial wave that followed iconic works like uh, Necromancer, Blade Runner, and Akira Recycle 2 using their conceits and visuals in new ways. Over time, these tropes have been distilled into the core of the genre, all the, Im- the imagery with none of the messages. Rock and Roll and Desperate and Dangerous One game where the malcontents and outsiders get to star in is Shadowrun Dragonfall. The Shadowrun series is unlike the mashup fantasies of cyberpunk that exaggerate the cliché of each, where the dragon demands tribute and PD personalities admired by villains are one and the same. Smog cast as Max Headroom. Perhaps the, it's that exaggeration of the basic, basic tropes that make Cy- Shadowrun feel true to cyberpunk fiction in spite of the elves. Shadowruns are hackers and spies who can be hired online like Uber, but for corporate espionage. In Dragonfall, your band of runners have a secret base under a market in the anarchist free state of Berlin. It is as much about protecting the societal dregs who are your neighbors, drug addicts, and shifty coffee dealers that is about making money. Also, one of the party members is an actual punk, the former leader of a band with a wonderful name, Meskerf Kumpf. Cyberpunk adjacent games like the weirdly seem more likely to feature the most cyberpunk pr- protagonists. Sci fi horror games like Bloodnet and Magarun Dark Pulse are perfect examples, even though they add vampires in the Kutula mythos. The hacker heroes of Watchdog 2 and Quadero Cowboy and Elsa Heartbreak would all feel at home in the glowing near future cities, even though their games are set in modern day, the 1980s in a fictional town in Sweden, respectively. As movies like Sneakers, Hackers, and Inception, they, they're telling cyberpunk stories about how information wants to be free. Unchecked power is really bad, just without the chromed up setting. You know, I never thought of Inception as cyberpunk, but now you think about it, it is, it does have the ethos of a cyberpunk um, story. Right now, CD Project Red is working on Cyberpunk 2077, a game that promises to be so chromed up you'll be able to see our reflections in it. Like Shadowrun, it's based on a tabletop RPG, but this time one with more purest visions. Mike Podsmith, Cyberpunk 2020, in which the players are cast as anti-corporate edge runners and who are getting too many implants could cause cyber psychosis. The trailer for Cyberpunk 2077 features a member of the masked cat cops who hunt these cyber psychos, arresting and recruiting a cyber cyborg killer. But while the tabletop game has cops among its playable roles, it also features net runners, biker nomads, and rocker boys and rocker girls who use the power of music to spread their political message. It lists players immediately the gangs of members of the Michael Laws 400 Boys or the rock stars of the Norman Spinner Little Heroes and so get closer to the underrepresented elements in the genre. His promotional video for Cyberpunk 20 Red on adapting the game talks about what he considers to be important in the cyberpunk. It's not the technology he says, it's the feel. It's getting that dark, gritty, rain wet street feeling, but at the same time getting that rock and roll, lost, desperate, and dangerous quality. Uh, Pond Smith goes on to quote one of Gibson's famous lines from the short story Burning Chrome The street finds its own use for things. Cyberpunk isn't just about alienation that comes with a future shock or questions about humanity raised by cybernetic enhancement and artificial intelligence. It's also about the way the powerless people find strength and solace by repurposing the future for their own ends. Gibson wrote that the streets finds its own use for things, not people who work for security agencies find their own use for things. The streets and their habits are central cyberpunks, and the powerless who suffer most in the kind of authoritarian regime cyberpunk fiction depicts, and games you can do with getting back to the idea that the rebels, misfits, and vandals, and people who can't afford to play the suit getting matter. So I thought that was a very interesting read. We'll eventually do um, entire kind of a breakdown of what cyberpunk is um, on a work from the metaverse but I'm looking forward is kind of one of the reasons why I talked about to cyberpunk 2077 and I will be doing a review on Herosia Thought Bubble when this game does come out. So Purse.io is a Bitcoin service that provides the access for Bitcoin users to be able to purchase um, items off of Amazon. Uh, They've been around for 2014. Um, They've gone through some improvements in uh, different iterations, if you will, within their system. But their primary focus has been allowing for users of Bitcoin to be able to purchase items uh, through them um, on 
on to Amazon, really. And they do this by a very unique way. Um, but first, before we get into how they do that, let's, let's talk a little bit about the history of the company. Uh, like I said, they came out in 2014. Uh, this comes from Crunchbase. Uh, they've gone through three rounds of investment. Uh, total equity is $1.3 million. They're based in San Francisco, California. The founders are Andrew Lee and Kent Wu. And you can find their information both via Facebook, Twitter, and, and LinkedIn. They had an initial round of undisclosed amount of two, pe two people funding or two sources of seed funding in April 2014, another 30K seed funding in 2014, and then three investors, one of the lead investors being the Digital Currency Group of December 2015 of $1 million. They also have had Roger Ver, um, and we'll talk about him. Well, we talk about him in the um, Musings of the Shies episode of Business People, as far as uh, the series of episodes about uh, the the block size debate, part of the business episode, uh, where we talk about the various business interest groups if you have here. But overall, you know, it has about six to ten employees. Uh, it's based in San Francisco. It's pretty accessible. They have a blog post. They keep the um, keep their customers very well informed. They have probably one of the better, I think, customer um, services of all the uh, Bitcoin companies out there. But um, we'll also talk about the problems with Purse.io because they've had some issues with their customer relationships as well. But basically how this company works, and we'll go directly to the Coindesk article that breaks it down. It goes like this. And this comes out of 2014, and we'll talk about some of the changes that have happened with Purse. So uh, Coindesk, uh, this article is by Daniel Kari. A good startup, they say, should find a problem and solve it eloquently. Well, California-based company Purse.io solves two problems and ties the solution together in one neat package. How Purse.io can save shave 25% off of Bitcoin buyers' Amazon's bills. That's the title of the article. Uh, the company is marketing its services to people who would like to purchase items at Amazon using Bitcoin, which the retail giant doesn't yet accept. But integral to his solution are those who want to obtain Bitcoin using a credit card, perhaps in areas where exchanges are not available. By matching these two markets, Purse.io is able to offer Bitcoin purchases on Amazon powered by a kind of a Bitcoin exchange that uses a buyer's discount to incentivize Bitcoin owners to sell the digital currency. The process is similar to peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces where Purse.io acts as an intermediary intermediary and offers users a platform, a Bitcoin wallet, and escrow for transactions. Andrew Lee, co-founder of Purse, told Coindesk, I think people that try to realize that they just saved 25% on Amazon are excited about the possibility. For the first time, they've been able to do something useful with Bitcoin rather than buy in and hold. How it works. First, when someone, and they always use Alice, I'm going to change the name to Pamela. And wants to use Bitcoin to purchase items for a discount from Amazon. Uh, Pamela deposits Bitcoin in her purse.io account. Then using a share URL, she imports her Amazon wish list into uh, purse and indicates what level of discount she would like for the item. When complete, the list is posted on the purse marketplace. Next, someone looking to obtain Bitcoin for a similar amount will, will call them Robert, which is too similar to Bob, so Steve accepts the transactions and purchases the items as Pamela's wish list using a credit card soon after the items are shipped to, to Pamela. Once the items have been received, Pamela notifies his purse, at which point her Bitcoin is released from escrow and is sent to Steve. It's kind of like an exchange, but with, with that Amazon layer, explains Kent Liu, the second founder of the company. It's worth noting that while the, it, there's a recommended 25% maximum discount, in fact, the user sets the amount and transactions have been accepted with discount as high as 45%. However, uh, Lou explained that, it, that there's a sweet spot of the item price compared to a percentage discount that is likely to make the transaction quickly accepted. Anything between 15% at 500 total price will get taken. All about the incentive. Lou said that he came up with the idea of purse about a year ago when the Bitcoin's price had risen up to a level not previously seen before. And as a result, there's a number of new BTC-related services appearing. 
People are excited to spend Bitcoin. The problem, at least from Lou's perspective, is that every service charge fees. Why not give people an incentive to unload Bitcoin, allow others improved access to the cryptocurrency? It's difficult to buy Bitcoin. It's really, really hard to do. Other markets in is people who cannot overcome that difficulty. The difficulty is not going to decrease, but easily anytime soon. Instead of charging Bitcoin buyers on first, the company levels a 1% fee on those selling the Bitcoin and get an Amazon discount, easing the Bitcoin on ramp. Globally, it's still globally it's still not easy to buy Bitcoin. While in the U.S., users have a checking account can easily convert dollars into Bitcoin using exchanges like Coinbase. In many countries, there is no way to convert the local fiat currency into a digital currency without jumping through a lot of hoops. Doing so might mean exchanging one fiat currency into USD and then wiring to a company such as Bitstamp, which will exchange it it into Bitcoin at every step of the way fees charge. However, someone with an international credit card can purchase items on Amazon from a pr- from pretty much anywhere. Spinning credits. So essentially anyone living in a country that does not have a viable Bitcoin exchange could be a potential customer for Purse. It's a better value proposition to many. Furthermore, the fact that the affiliates of Amazon receive a certain amount of credits that may be spent on the website may boost take up of the service, which has occurred and we'll talk about in, in, in an instance. Someone in India, for example, may want to convert those credits into Bitcoin rather than an Amazon item or even rupees. Relying on Amazon. So what would Purse do if Amazon shut them down? The founders have thought about this, but believe that for the time being, they're providing a service that is in demand. We think we're helping Amazon. They don't want to take Bitcoin now. They're not ready for it. In April, an Amazon executive said the company decided against accepting Bitcoin due to the weak customer demand. Furthermore, it's added complexity for the company compared with other realtors that currently accept the digital currency. According to Purse, Amazon's marketplace strategy is problematic. Having so many third-party sellers, a good portion of their products on the Realtor's website are not sourced from Amazon itself, creating a complexity the likes of Tiger, Direct, and Overstock don't have to deal with. I don't think we've seen a big retailer except Bitcoin that has a marketplace, explained the Trustless escrow. Although Purse provides a wallet for users to store Bitcoin they have acquired, Lou said the company would prefer not to store substantial customer funds, Right now, we're holding people's money, but we don't want to do that. However, by holding funds until Amazon items are delivered, Purse has positioned itself in the digital currency escrow business, which could be a promising strategy. A recent Fin ruling indicated that digital currency escrow is not a money transmitter business, which likely to mean less regulatory scrutiny for a company as, as more authorities issue guidance. In the future, the company plans to offer multi-signature transactions that have three keys, one for the buyer, one for the seller, and one for purse, creating a trustless form of escrow. None of us hold of us hold enough keys. Nobody has control over the funds unless two people agree, said Lou. Building a footprint. For several months, Purse has been working on his product at the Plug and Play Technology Center in Sunnyvale, California, since being accepted as one of several Bitcoin startups in the accelerator scheme. As a recent Bitcoin meetup at the center, which provides assistance to new tech startups. The company talked to Patrick Mark, uh, general counsel for the Bitcoin Foundation. He told he told us pretty good from the regulatory standpoint. Uh, Lee and Lou have now bought in some extra hands as far as development goes, and they hope to raise more funds. Um, and then kind of goes on a little bit about that. Okay, so one of the other things that um, has changed. From its initial um, going on was you had to have a credit card to order to use it and then they opened it up to Amazon gift cards and Amazon points and the reason why they did that was because of Merkle Turk. Uh, Merkle Turk is a, a system that Amazon has where they have these job type postings or tasks that allow for people to do these kind of very tedious menial tasks uh, through their system and get paid 5, 10, 15, 15 cents. So, for example, checking a receipt and seeing if it um, looks good or not, or doing a survey. Um, what's another task I see, I've seen on there? Checking a website and na- going through these little navigation protocols. Now, for brand of Western based thing, that's five cents, ten cents, fifteen cents a task is not a whole lot of money, but 
eighty percent of Merkel truckers are outside of the U.S. and fifteen, ten, twenty cents. Um, I've seen as high as five dollars. Um, there's been a few Merkels that have gone even higher to twenty five, but those are very rare and they get pounced on a lot uh, by you know top tier Merkels. Uh, Merkel Turkers, if you will, uh, it adds up eventually. You know, eventually you get the Amazon credit or Amazon gift card, and then you can then turn around and purchase something through Amazon, and then you get that item and you sell it in your home country for twice the amount because it's not so readily available. And that's how a lot of people are able to do because you can't directly cash out through Amazon. Um, if you do so, it takes like a I've seen reports up to six months to receive um, your monies, uh, which is a long time for somebody to wait. Uh, even using services internally within our country of exchanging Amazon gift cards or Amazon points for whatever their currency is, is still very difficult. And so this is a bridge for a lot of people where they're able to get BTC and it's more lickable than an Amazon gift card, if you will. Like, for example, this article here kind of covers it. Yukon partners with Purse.io uh, to convert Amazon gift cards to rupees. Uh, this was of 2015, so it's been going around for a while. So you get MTurk to into BC into rupees. Uh, Purse and Yukon can, can help translate Amazon gift card balances to Bitcoin and rupees. Work on hits to earn Amazon credit and then turn gift card balances to Bitcoin and rupees. Uh, hits is what um, the Merkle, uh, the mechanical uh, Turk tasks are called, is a marketplace that connects individuals who perform tasks in exchange for Amazon credit. There are certain tasks which can be carried out much faster by humans than computers, and mechanical Turk is an artificial intelligence for outsourcing some parts of a computer program to humans. It is a great system, but cash out options are limited. Over 80% of uh, Mechanical Turks live outside the U.S. where direct deposit is not an option and there are two cash out options on Mechanical Turk. USD check in the mail or instant Amazon gift card balance. Through purse, Turkers can exchange Amazon gift card balances for Bitcoin in two days, though Yuancon Turkers can sell their Bitcoins and get rupees to their bank account. And they can register through uh, purse.io. And so this is an option of allowing people to be able to, to make a living. Um, there's a lot of parts of the country where five, oh not country, but globally where five, ten dollars, twenty dollars is a lot of money. It means a significant amount. It's, you know, um, I don't think people realize that when um, discussing the economics globally. It's so abstract for them. But the ability to change things out and get, you know, the Bitcoin or getting rupees in this case directly it, it's in a much easier usage is very important and for a person to do that it's it's filling that market void it's filling that void that a lot of people talk about uh, when they talk about cryptocurrencies as being a currency of the world of that allowing for people to have control of their own personal wealth now since um, their initial moving off what purse has done is they've done three things um, they've opened up just from credit cards to the Amazon gift card system. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that globally speaking, you know, Amazon gift cards are almost like cash, really. Um, they're dispensed through all these different affiliate programs. You have the, the Mechanical Turk, you know, the Merkle Turk program, where a lot of people are, or that's how they they have a job. They sit in these internet cafes and do that all day long and um, they're able to take advantage of that. The other thing that they've done, and they just opened it up this year, is they have allowed for, uh, you open it up a store. So now you can now sell your goods, whatever your goods could be, whether it's a new item or a used item, kind of like an eBay situation, and you can sell it for Bitcoin. And so by doing that, it's another option where you're not just buying something off of Amazon. Maybe you're buying like a specialty item, like a like a food item or a specific type of t-shirt or some type of service. You can do so through purse and, and receive Bitcoin for that. So if you have like, you know, I don't know, coffee or you're already selling items either through your website, here's another avenue for you to be able to do so. Um, 
and also in the kind of competition with places like Open Bazaar, which is decentralized, um, those type of places, you have Purse right here that is doing the same thing. Um, I have an item that's up, which I'll talk about towards the end of the episode. And so by opening that up, it allows for a different avenue for people to be able to earn Bitcoin, if you will, and eventually, you know, get into the place where we're closing that that loop within the cryptocurrency space and we're not we're seeing less transfers of fiat into bits uh into cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency out into fiat less and less than that is going to start occurring you can also then be a an earner you can earn bitcoin by buying order orders on amazon in exchange for bitcoin so you can go to that marketplace and be be able to do that and pick the the item that you wish to purchase and this allows you to obtain and to gain um, Bitcoin. It used to be closed and now it's opened up. So you have to register your account. You have to have an Amazon account linked up, a credit card available, and you can start doing this and purchasing and buying um, these items for whatever amount of Bitcoin is set available. So it's, it's an interesting item. It's an interesting system. Again, I think it's very unique in that sense and I think it's helpful for getting Bitcoin out there into other different marketplaces uh, to other people's hands if you will but also another avenue for your people either earn Bitcoin or you know spend it um, you can buy directly and get the things you need through Amazon by using your Bitcoin if you will so we're gonna do a comparison and then we'll talk about the problems with this type of system if you will. And there are problems, there are a little bit of issues, and a lot of it has to do just really with the legacy type of system that Purse still has to operate in, even though it deals with Bitcoin. Now, before we get into the problems of Purse.io, uh, let's do a little comparison. This article comes from the Merkle. Uh, it came out this year, so April 25th. It's Purse.io versus um, all four BTC. It was written by J.P. Bontix. I came out in April of this year. So this is an obvious correlation between Bitcoin and Amazon, even though using the two together is not as straightforward as one might think. It's still not possible to use Bitcoin directly on Amazon, yet there are some alternative solutions to do so. All for BTC and Purse allow cryptocurrency users to do exactly that, although they go about it in different ways. Purse. Many Bitcoin users are all too familiar with the concept provided by Purse.io. It kind of explains what we already know. A lot of people are puzzled when it comes to how Purse achieves this discount. The concept of Purse is quite intriguing in this regard. Users who hold Bitcoin can create an Amazon wish list, select the items they're looking to purchase with Bitcoin. They can also set their own uh, discount percentage, although any amount between 10 and 15% has a good chance of being picked up quickly. Users who have an Amazon gift card balance will purchase the order on behalf of the Bitcoin owner in exchange for a specified Bitcoin amount. Once the users receive the order as expected, the Bitcoins are then released to the person responsible for purchasing the item. This allows Bitcoin users to set their own discount, which ultimately results in a premium to be paid off because looking to acquire Bitcoin. Purse also provides a buy now feature results in a 5% discount on Amazon orders shipped to a U.S. address, which includes prime shipping. All for BTC. International users who want to buy things from Amazon with Bitcoin have to look for alternative solutions. Even though Purse is working on an international expansion, All for BTC is a more than worthy alternative for international Amazon users. Although there is quite some difference between the two services, the big difference is how All for BTC does not offer any discounts whatsoever, but merely acts as a convenient third-party service provider. There's nothing wrong with that, although as all 4BTC provides an excellent service to its customers, it's possible to buy things from Amazon or any other site in the world with Bitcoin. The only requirement is how the seller or vendor will need to ship to your address directly. All 4BTC will, pay, will place and pay the order on behalf of the user, for which they will be compensated in Bitcoin, including a small surcharge. It's good to have such a service extended beyond Amazon, though much, that much is certain. All for BTC is an excellent service for people who do not own or wish to own a Bitcoin debit card. Such cards allow anyone to spend Bitcoin whether they want an online or offline environment. However, those, these cards are subject to limitations and sometimes even fees, which make these less attractive to some users. One can never have enough alternative ways to spend Bitcoin for everyday goods. 
and all for PTC certainly has a place in the Bitcoin community. So if you wish to, as a user end of Bitcoin, be able to purchase items for, you know, for off of Amazon and your international person, this is the, this is the way to go. I think it's important just, you know, as far as market goes to have as much diversification and choice and options for people to be able to find and buy and get something for Bitcoin. Um, the sooner, though, that we are able or capable of getting closing that loop, if you will, um, buying direct, is, it's going to be better for long term for the community. It also just uh, does um, Amazon, also does eBay and um, Alibaba.com, which is you know the Chinese version of Amazon and a great market service of its own, really. And all you have to do just to use all for BTC is you just uh, paste the link of what you want to buy. Um, they buy it on your behalf and then you, it goes through an escrow service and you basically um, purchase something with Bitcoin using them as a, um, a third party mechanism. You, you yourself are, there's no, um, you can say buy option, like you can't be a individual seller who buys Bitcoin directly from them, There's that that's not an option that they have. They basically are a, um, a third-party avenue, as the Merkle article states. There are problems with Purse.io, and reading this from a Reddit post, it was done almost two years ago, so here we go. Before using Purse.io, a few things everyone should know. There seems to be quite a few threads signing, singing the praises of Purse.io recently, along with the usual detractors screaming, they're nothing but a pure scam. As a long-time user of Purse, 20-plus purchases, I feel like people should know a few things before they decide to jump in or stay from it forever. First, the basic basics. Yes, there are scammers on Purse. Quite a few of them, actually. No, Purse is not all scam. The majority of the buyers aren't, and you can minimize your risk knowing what you're doing. What, those things, what are those things one should know, you ask? Here are a few that I've gathered from my experience in the new slash room. One, as long as you're okay with just 5% discount, Purse Instant is generally safe. Purse.io became a real middleman here, ordering your stuff and buying your Bitcoins and assuming all the risk. Do note, however, that the 5% may, might or might not be worth it if you're coming straight from fiat to BTC to Purse, as your fiat conversion can take a while and BP's price fluctuations can be unpredictable. The flagship Paster Wishlist Exchange is, of course, where the big, big discounts are. First things first, do not buy gift cards, you will get scammed. The reason gift cards are instant transfer, it doesn't allow time for fraud detection. By the time Amazon slash CCC company detects fraud and revokes the gift card, your coins are already in someone else's hand. Shipping delays and shipping times is what makes fraud detection possible. I repeat, do not buy gift cards on perks. Edit, as others in the thread have pointed out, physical cards are probably much safer than gift card codes. I so much prefer physical goods, but you may have different ideas. Three, cancellation has happened. Um, I personally have had um, an order canceled on me, and I personally have canceled an order. And I think it's important, like, when you, and Curse has gotten better at this, to look at the shipping, because they have fast shipping, and then they tell you if there's delay in shipping. If you're not careful of your item and you're selected, and it's coming all the way from a slow boat in China, um, the person who's purchasing your item might not want to wait that long, and you yourself personally might not want to wait that long as well for an item. So, be very careful when you're picking your items and the shipping stuff because that could factor in. So here we go. And it's not necessarily a fraud. I've had a few people cancel because it turned out the items shipped from Asia and will take excessively long time to arrive. Translation, it will take a long time for them to get their coins. They were nice enough to tell me that and that's how I know. Four, things like a, think like a purchaser. Think of what you've seen on local Bitcoins and the kind of discount people are willing to give to get BTC. Do you really think anyone's who's not a froster is going to give you a 50% discount, discount for BTC, be reasonable. I generally ask for 20%, pushing the limits, but not improbable on LBC, and no troubles getting my orders through at all. But sometimes orders are canceled because the other side was canceled, and it looks like the other side was a scammer and got caught. That's okay. It's a good sign. The system works. Just put it up again, and perhaps with a little less discount. Six. If you're really paranoid about black vans busting down your door, so far it happened exactly once. Ship to a public address, office, and receiving service, etc. 7. If you encounter an actual scammer who is somehow not caught in a transit, was notified by curse, perhaps for a return, just follow instructions, relax, you'll be fine. 
It does not happen to me, but I did hear it happen to someone else. My impression is that it happens very rarely, but it doesn't hurt to know that exists. What do I think about scamming situations in Purse.io? Personally, Craigslist is full of scammers, yet people use it every day. And people are generally advised to be savvy against scammers. Purse is no different, and from what I see, there are a lot less scammers on Purse than Craigslist. If you're savvy enough to use Craigslist, you're savvy enough to use Purse. Know what you're doing and you'll be fine. Thanks for reading and feel free to share some additional points. So this is the post that um, he was referencing to, and this occurred in December 2014. So this per this post was uh, the previous post was from uh, from our Bitcoin. It was from user uh, imagining our username. This is also from our Bitcoin and is from user B N N K L. And he posts since my house is being searched right now. Small reminder: be careful buying a first bad I O. So I just got a call. I just got called. That the police, the police are searching my place with a warrant, and I'm ordered. I ordered an Apple TV in July, which turned out to be fraud. Had eight transactions there, which resulted in two charges: one for fraud and the other for computer fraud. Both first transactions. I've had quite some hassle for for saving of twenty-eight dollar pounds. My lawyer fees up to now are more than ten times this. I want to drive home for Christmas now and check back um, slash six hours. Six hours. Be careful when using purse. Only use items shipped by Amazon. Stay set to safe. Edit. And he has a couple edits in this post. Oh wow, this blew up. I was on the Autobahn. Just came home. We'll read through. First thing first was leaked info. Um, so first thing first. They took a couple of computers from my teenage years of, and the one I gave to my sister. A lot of paper stuff and probably looking for CC details as evidence. And passwords were was also something they were looking for. So they took my treasure wallet. Treasure word list with 86 BTC. It felt like walking into a nightmare, but nonetheless, I have to mention that the support of Curse.io. They contacted me, offered to reimburse my lawyer fees. Thank you, Andrew, and I appreciate your help over the time so far. I, I do have way more. I can give you the whole picture, which is way more disturbing. Edit. Um, this is edited at the end of May 2015. Just got my stuff back. So he posted. Okay, and then there's this comment right here that I'll talk. Breaking news, site designed to use for laundering money from stolen credit cards turns out to be used for laundering money from stolen credit cards. So, this person got, uh, it was kind of wonky the way they worded it, but they got support by uh, Purse.io, they got their stuff back, the word fees were covered. But one of the biggest critiques against Purse.io is saying that this is a money laundering service where uh, card scammers, whether it be for credit cards or uh, gift cards, use the site to get PPC. And I think that's, while well, a valid critique, I don't think that's necessarily the purpose of Purse.io, and I don't think that's any different from just straight up Amazon or any other retail place. Credit card, the credit card industry is fraught with fraud. It just is. There's no way around it, and so are gift cards. So scammers are going to use every avenue they can to utilize that stolen information to get goods and transfer that into some other form of wealth, whether it be selling the goods, uh, high, uh, um, high dollar items and selling them at a discount and still getting some kind of return on investment, if you will, or using it for personal usage. That's just the case. Um, I think Purse personally has been very good with you know two-factor application. Um, with the escrow service, um, working both with Amazon and credit card companies when it does happen, and shutting down those accounts. I don't believe that uh, that is an overwhelming amount of credit card scams or gift card scams because they wouldn't be able to survive, really, if that was the case. Um, the other critique is that people are saying, who would purchase, you know, of such a high rate for BPC. So if someone's offering, say for example, um, they put up a wish list which totals out to $250 in Bitcoin. And because they're seeking, you know, um, 15 or 50 percent, do the math here real quick. So if someone puts up uh, a wish list that's worth $300 and they want a 15 percent discount. Um, that means they only pay two hundred and I just do the math. Two hundred fifty-five dollars in and in BBC. That means the person is paying a markup of forty-five dollars, which is 
which is a lot. It's fifteen percent more below the market price, plus whatever fees purse adds on to there uh, for being the escrow service. Um, I don't think that's a big deal. I think because considering you're not doing AML KYC requirements, you are taking a risk in and of itself buying a credit card. Considering that this is really for places where the exchanges are not that um, prevalent or easy to utilize, the fact that uh, people that have Amazon gift cards or points, as we talked about about the uh, Indian um, Google exchanges occurring through Curse, I think that that critique is just oh, it's just nitpicky in my personal opinion. I think if you can get PPC for a reasonable amount above above board, if you will, and it comes into your hands, that is important. The easier it is, the better it is for the community. Um, it's also very easy if you think about it. You're using your Amazon um, account, you're using a credit card, you're not giving your information to another body or anything like that. The only people that have their information is already the credit card or Amazon. If you're exchanging out your Amazon points or your uh, gift card point, you know, your gift card uh, into BTC, then it's you have a stronger wealth uh, creation there, if you will, instead of Amazon points or Amazon gift card seats. There's nothing much you can, more you can do than other than buying Amazon stuff and then maybe selling that Amazon stuff and then be able to get something for it. Um, I think people don't understand how difficult it is truly to get Bitcoin, especially those from the Western world or the United States. It's really, really difficult. And local bitcoins is not the solution, considering that there's even scammers there, and it's a little sketchy, and you have to deposit in people's accounts. And if you live in Hopunk and you know, in the middle of nowhere, and you literally would have to, if you want to do face-to-face transactions, drive 300 miles to be able to do that, that's that's difficult in and of itself. Instead, you could probably use something like a purse.io system, where you register in use your Amazon account and your credit card and you're able to buy Bitcoin for a slight markup. Um, Bitcoin in and itself is not going to go back to zero. It's going to fluctuate. Right now, at the recording of this episode, it's $1,700. If you think a couple years ago when it was around two fifty, dollars and that person made that uh, $45 markup to get that $250 worth of BTC, um, you know, it's now $1,700 that they, they you know, held this whole time. Um, you know, it's almost, it's like almost four times, not four times, I just can't do math today. Ugh. It's almost seven times the value. It's close to seven times the value from initial purchase. It's always going to go up. It's going to be a wash. This whole return on investment stuff, I I think too much of what is happening, particularly from the Western perspective, hold on a second. So overall, I think we're, as a community are applying old financial terms to this new financial system and also not recognizing how very difficult it is to take fiat into uh, into cryptocurrency. Um, the sooner we close the loop, the, the better off globally we will for this new type of economic system. So my personal uh, experience with PURSE um, has been fairly good. Overall, it's been a very, uh, overall, I have had a very pleasant experience with Purse.io. Um, I've made purchases through there. I haven't used their wish list system. I just made directed instant buys. Um, I've had, like I stated, I've had a couple, I've canceled an order. I've had an order cancel on me. Everything has come through. Um, it's readily simple. They've made searching much easier. At first, you know, you kind of have like a hunt and peck. But it made it much easier to uh, look for items and buy things directly from Amazon. I might try it out and see what the wish like system looks like. Um, at this time, I just haven't found anything of like a major order if I wanted to buy with BTC as of yet to try their system. Really, it's just been mostly small buys and Christmas buys is when I've used it. Um, I'm going to look into their um, user and of buying BTC and see what that experience is like purchasing somebody's order with a credit card. It would be interesting to see, you know, I do have Amazon Prime to see what that experience is like and whether or not it's worth, you know, the benefit of 
and using um, Purse.io as a means of obtaining Bitcoin. I do have a store and I, I have a link in the show notes where I'm trying to sell. It's my way of trying to, you know, get away from transferring from fiat into BT, BTC or any type of cryptocurrency by, you know, trying to close the loop by um, selling something and buying my items, you know, for whatever inventory I may have directly and trying to, you know, close that loop, if you will. Um, I have a link in the show notes. It's just a kind of a niche um, item. It's been up there for a month, really. It's called um, Skybox 1960s um, DC um, Kingdom Come trading card set. It has an Alex Ross a Hawkman autograph. It's for sale for 40 bucks. But overall, you know, I've had a very pleasant experience. I also have our affiliate link if you're interested and curious, as well as a link directly to the site. Uh, you don't have to use the affiliate link, but it just helps, you know, paying for the cost of the network and stuff like that if you were to do so. You have to purchase, I think, like up to 50 um, bucks um, on on um, first.io for me to get compensation or anything like that. But I would recommend it to people. I would recommend mostly to do the instant buy, really, especially if you know what your items are. If you are, just like the recommendation of the person I write about using purse.io, if you are going to do a wish, wish list, you know, stick between 15 to uh, 10 to 15 percent for BTC. Um, their marketplace in general, the storefront, is just something they recently opened up this year. It'll be interesting to see how it competes against uh, the increasing decentralized marketplaces like Open Bazaar and other marketplaces that have uh, popped up to um, kind of get that gap to try to get people into purchasing and buying items and selling items for um, cryptocurrency in general. But overall, I would I would give it um I rate it seven out of ten. Like I said, there's a little bit of issues. Like you know, you have to be cautious and careful. When buying stuff like that, especially if you're doing a wish list system, there's people that have had issues. But overall, I think it's a great experience. I think they, they need to refine their Amazon listings for advice a little bit better, personally, I think. But overall, I would recommend it. I think that as far as the user end, it's very good. It's just, you know, if, you, if you're if you more into electronics, it just seems to be so heavily focused as far as buy power, power if you will, for Bitcoin. I think just because of the type of users they use um, are into cryptocurrencies are pretty tech savvy, so they're more into electronics. Um, I would like to see the ecosystem diversify more, but again, this this you know it's just, just early adopters and hurdles and getting the market going. Um, there might be just other avenues that might prompt that pump, if you will, of getting people to spend their Bitcoin. But that's it for the episode. Um, I thank you very much. And uh, until next time for my next review. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you. And until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.